So we are talking about this great, great book today. I see many of you have in, in front of you, and we're really honored to have Chris Wiggins uh, talk about this. So uh, we have some people in the audience uh, who I want to point out to. One is my colleague, Sandra Motz, who can wave her hand. She gave a great talk here uh, not long ago. I saw Gita Johar come in. Uh, Gita, you, who's back there, who uh, was uh, the person who had a dialogue with uh, Sandra and is a co-worker with me on this project called BAID, the Business in AI and Democracy. It's, it's part of what this business school calls the hub. The hub is the uh, idea to have the school be a little bit more thinking about uh, issues long-term, research-based, research-driven, uh, but also with a, a strong uh, hope that it has some uh, social impact uh, as well uh, and, public, uh, and public impact. So we look for people who have uh, great things to say, and uh, one of them surely is, uh, is Chris Wiggins, who uh, is a professor here on, uh, on campus in multiple schools, uh, from statistics to engineering to systems biology, systems biology too, which I, uh, which I, uh, I saw. So, uh, and, and, in, and also carries a hat as the chief scientist over at the uh, New York Times. Uh, so he puts this all together, and plus he's got twins and a, uh, another child, so uh, he's, uh, he's living the life, uh, the, New York, the New York life. Today, uh, we're gonna talk about this uh, new book. Uh, so what, uh, what we have in mind is to spend maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes, uh, ask a few questions to Chris. He may take it in, in various kinds of uh, of directions uh, to give you a sense of what it's about. And then well, we're going to open it up to uh, questions. We should have 20, 25 minutes for, for, uh, for questions uh, from you. Uh, so uh, is uh, interesting uh, for us, because obviously as a group, which is AI and democracy, um, you know, he has strong machine learning AI uh, interests. Uh, plus he's at one of the most important democratic institutions in this country, if not the world, and that's the New York, the New York Times. So it's a nice, it's a nice mixture uh, uh, for us. So let me uh, sit down and uh, maybe ask, start off by asking a very simple question to Chris, uh, and that is, uh, so how did you come to uh, to writing this book and and uh, spending investing this time and passion, which is so so clear in the, in its writing. Thank you, Bruce, and thanks for having me. Uh, it's true, it did take a lot of time. Um, the, the book, in some ways, is many of the things that I've wanted to talk about for a long time as a machine learning researcher and as an engineering educator. Um, the, the book, though, really grew most directly out of a class. So I've been teaching this class since 2017 with Matt Jones. Matt Jones is a history professor. And both of us share an interest in, in machine learning and data and data-empowered algorithms and simply how it came to pass that so much of our reality is driven by data-empowered algorithms. I, I think of history as a great sort of form of root cause analysis of why things got that way. So I'm a, I'm a fan of history, whereas Matt is an actual historian. Um, and I would say the, group, the, the book rather grew out of my own practical interest as a data scientist, a machine learning researcher, as well as somebody who's teaching young people who will um, go on to create these algorithms, work for companies that are deploying the algorithms in our lives. And of course, all of the students and all of us as citizens live in a reality that's shaped up by those algorithms. So the book is an attempt to create a through line for how we got that way, as well as some metaphors and frames to help us all think about how we're collectively shaping the future. So, so maybe you can tell us a bit about this class that you start off. Sure, so the class um, is a class called Data, Past, Present, and Future. It's a class intended to be for any undergraduate, well, any student, with no prerequisites. And on Tuesday, we read important papers, and on Thursday, we open up Python. So the idea is that we are going to engage with the reading, and we're also going to engage with the data. And that class has been going on since 2017. As a, it started out as a small seminar class to sort of stress test some of the material, and by now it's a larger lecture class. Uh, and the class, like the book, covers really three parts. Uh, one part is a history of mathematical statistics, which is a, a road well-traveled in the literature, basically how 
making sense of data became part of the academy and part of the way we teach young people. Part two is about data-empowered algorithms and how they came to have a life of their own in private corporations. And part three is trying to understand what that means for our present and future in terms of the ethics of data, governance around data, and what are the present contests that are going to shape our future. So uh, Chris, so uh, I should have mentioned to me you're a You did your undergraduate here at, at Columbia. Yes. And then you did your, your PhD work over at uh, Princeton. Maybe I mentioned that. Uh, theoretical physics. Correct. And today you're here talking about your belief in data. And uh, Correct. Right, it's being really, it's really critical. So I want to just maybe turn to that part of the, of the, uh, of the book. Uh, and there's much, you have all this great history in there. And you pull together in this timeline, which is fascinating. Yeah, things about Turing and how that developed, et cetera. But the, well, I'm going to go to the post-war years and turn to Dartmouth. Yes. Um, we have that, you know, that original grouping of people to think about artificial intelligence, which I guess was coined about that about that time. And you you bring up in the book this sort of, um, of early tension between people who think more top-down, more symbolic logic, et cetera people who were thinking more about, about data. Maybe that was not the dominant thinking, but it was already there, I think, you were writing. Could you, could you just tell us about that particular uh, moment? Sure, there's a lot to say there. So it's true that I did my undergraduate at Columbia College. So I'm a product of the core curriculum, at, for those of you who know about Columbia College, and sort of a, a great books um, training, uh, which, which really embraces the humanities and, and has the hypothesis that a, a good grounding in liberal arts is useful no matter what you do. And that did influence the way we taught the class. Actually, my co-author, Matt Jones, was for a while um, a professor of contemporary civilization, which is one of the core classes of the core curriculum. Um, but yes, getting back to Dartmouth. So if we had this gathering in a different year, we may not be um, as focused on the words AI as we are right now, like basically since last November or so. But Dartmouth, um, the Dartmouth meeting in 1956 was a Dartmouth workshop on artificial intelligence. And you're, and you're right that that really is where the phrase was coined. Um, many phrases have a, um, an unclear birth date, but this is one of the phrases where it's pretty real clear. Uh, it's coined by John McCarthy, mathematician, and he's on record many, many years later as saying, I made up the term because we were trying to get money for the workshop in 1956. He's, he's quite clear that they were thinking about other phrases like um, autonomous, automata study, which was preferred term by uh, Claude Shannon. And he said, you know, that, that wasn't really what I was getting at. I was getting at the conjecture that any aspect of intelligence can be so precisely described that it could be programmed. And so that is the original vision of artificial intelligence from 1955. So the, the phrase sounds benign, but if you take it apart, you'll see that there's some presumptions there. It includes the idea that our intelligence can be described, that we know how we know things, and that we, pro we can just program it, which was the dominant paradigm for the next 30, 40 years. That the right way to understand AI, artificial intelligence, was to program it and to understand how we think. That has been completely flipped in the last 20 to 30 years, in which people have realized that that was hubris to think that we know how we think. And instead, a completely different paradigm, which is the data-driven paradigm, is to gather so much data and to use the right mathematics that you can learn from data a model which approximates how we think. So part of the story in the book is the way these terms have, are themselves moving targets. So artificial intelligence means different things in different decades, as does, in fact, statistics. So we try to take apart even the word statistics and how it means different things to different communities at different times. Um, but Dartmouth is really the birth date of artificial intelligence as a field. And what you see in the beginning is the dominance of the mathematical paradigm, not the data-driven paradigm, in which learning things through data was considered to be lesser than understanding things the way that really important fields like logic operate. To be fair, logic was intimately associated with mathematics all of the 20th century, certainly through 1950s. But the people who shaped it, who were largely logicians and mathematicians, 
felt like that was the highest form of intelligence and we should work on that as the first uh, battleground for artificial intelligence. So I'm going I'm to see if you can take us through a little, little, little through this history, what happened on it. The, um, but I remember one part of the book, can you all hear me pretty well? Okay. So um, is that Herbert Simon shows up. I'm not sure if you all know who Herbert Simon is, uh, but he eventually wins the Nobel Prize in economics. And a lot of people, and he got his PhD in political science from Chicago. Uh, and people in economics said, well, it's kind of odd, you know, what, what exactly did he do? And I think he got it for the sort of the bounded rationality work which he, he was working on. Just at the same time as the Dartmouth conference, he was writing those, those particular uh, papers. Uh, and then, but he shows up. I mean, I guess when he has time from his economics, uh, he wrote papers in, you know, the new emergent data sciences, which was coming up, uh, or artificial intelligence, which was, which was coming, uh, coming forward. And he shows up with this, this machine, right? Uh, at that time, an algorithm. An algorithm. Uh, so I didn't. So, so tell me more about that, and then, and the kind of the early hopes for the neural networks, et cetera, and things like that, and why it went. Why did artificial intelligence just go down to the floor and then come back all of a, all of a sudden? What's the, what's the story behind that? Golly, yes. So part of, part of the history of AI is an AI winter, a sort of nadir in which nobody in their right mind would claim to be doing artificial intelligence. And that period arguably was from the 80s until 2005 or so. It was sort of not something you said out loud if you worked on artificial intelligence. And Herb Simon had a role in that. So Herb Simon, as mentioned, won a Nobel Prize in economics. He also won the Turing Prize in computation. I think he's the only person ever to have an economics Nobel Prize and a Turing Prize. Um, and so Herb Simon. So he shows up at the Dartmouth conference and he has worked out an algorithm for doing automated theorem proving which nobody else who showed up in Dartmouth really had done anything to that point. Uh, so in some ways, Simon and Newell were way ahead of everybody else. They actually had done something substantive. Um, but he goes on over the next years to study how a form of artificial intelligence that's closely related with management sciences, actually, including work at, at the Rand Institute uh, in Los Angeles. The other thing that Herb Simon does, which I think is, is, um, makes a mark, in the history of artificial intelligence is as people are starting to consider the possibility that artificial intelligence would be done through learning, would be done through studying algorithms that would be presented with data that would then learn from the data how things operate in the world, Herb Simon shows up at, at, a, at probably the first workshop on machine learning and gives a talk called, Why Should Machines Learn? So Herb Simon does his part to keep machine learning down as a paradigm. That is the data-empowered approach to AI. He does his part to keep that paradigm down by giving this 1982 lecture published in 1983 called Why Should Machines Learn, in which he makes clear that um, looking at data is the wrong way. And the right way to get artificial intelligence is to understand schema and the representation of knowledge. And repeatedly in that lecture, he says, you should just program it. Right? So he's echoing the original rhetoric of, of McCarthy that the idea, how we would get artificial intelligence is to understand the way we solve problems and then to program it in a computer without using data whatsoever. So I would say that's part of Harb, Harb Simon's role. I mean, smart guy. But um, part of his, his role in AI is to, is to keep the data-driven paradigm down and to continue arguing that it's the wrong path, which, again, most of the life of artificial intelligence as a field has been to say that data was the wrong way, that it was the lesser vehicle, and that the right vehicle was to use mathematics and to understand how we would program things algorithmically. So, uh, so let's just kind of finish off this, this thing. So here's this, there still is a, some promise, but it was going through a bad period, to say the least. And we have, you know, initially, I think by reading your book that the brain was part of the, uh, the object. You were going to model the brain, the perceptron, that language, and yeah. et cetera. Um, but then somewhere in the book you say, but suddenly it was realized that's really not the goal. It's going to be a, more of a computational approach, and which may be independent of what these earlier efforts were, yes. were, uh, were about. So what I'm looking for is, what was the switch which then brought the air into the sails 
of AI sort of became so you know, dominant in the past the past few years. Yeah. So there's there's two sort of goals or um, dreams, aspirations of AI that that failed. Uh, one dream is the dream that we would understand the way we think and we would just program it. That, that turned out to fail. Uh, the other dream is that we would understand the way brains work and we would make something that simulated a brain, that simulated cognition. That failed. Uh, and at some point people realized that the right way to do it was using what we would now recognize as a statistical method to use lots and lots of data uh, and to use mathematics to approximate, given the data, whatever empirical input-output relation you had data to train on. So that approach was anathema to basically everyone who controlled the field of artificial intelligence, 1950s through 2005 or so. What flipped was really technological, right? The creation of larger computers and larger data sets, both of which were technological advances, right? Somebody had to invest time, effort, money in building bigger computers and harnessing larger data sets, putting them together, uh, and the empirical results of that approach really just took off a little bit in the late 90s, a little bit 15 years ago, but in particular about 10 years ago, people realized that far and away, just giving up on interpretability, giving up on understanding how we think, and just using abundant data and abundant computation produced results that no other approach could, could match. So uh, Chris, let me, let me ask you a question. Um, so that's great, and then, then you take it through a little bit to the current, and we'll ask you a question in a second about some of the regulatory aspects of it in society. And, um, but there's also a part of the book where you really talk about um, this kind of ongoing um, you know, seesaw, which is often found in, in engineering schools or in sciences, and applied sciences in general between what the university does and what does business do. Um, and there was this sort of issue that things got really expensive to, to, to do this research. Uh, and, and, and some of the budgets were beyond the reach even of very wealthy universities. I told you that even we fight over some of the, some of the chips here. Maybe it's more plentiful in the, in the physics department, uh, but it's, it's scarce. And if you want to do a lot of the research, many of the people go outside to work with you know, Amazon or Meta or, or so on. So is this a steady state or is this something which is, and does it matter to the, the way uh, science and research is going to work in the future? Somewhat. So it's a bit of a seesaw. So I would say post-World War II, there was tremendous investment by the intelligence community. This is a story that's really not so well told. Computation in the United States, which is also therefore computation, like digital computation was largely funded by the U.S. intelligence community. And it's a story that's, that's not very well documented. It's not part of our, our history of computation. But like all the big IBM machines were funded by the, and, and, and actually one of the participants in the original Dartmouth workshop was from IBM, um, were funded by the intelligence community. And then thereafter, IBM had to figure out how to market to industry these machines that they had. So IBM writes documents like this um, essentially marketing paper in 1958 saying we should create a new field of business intelligence. And that's a piece of marketing to convince businesses that they should buy these massive IBM machines, which originally were funded by the intelligence community. So now is not the first time when money was in industry rather than academia. Thereafter, there was certainly plenty of funding in academia. Again, it was largely coming from DOD. It was largely coming from DARPA, which was part of Department of Defense, to fund MIT, Stanford, and other places that created the field of artificial intelligence. So that seesaw between where the innovation was happening, industry or in academia, it's gone back and forth. Um, and it matters in terms of mission accomplished. It matters, Matt Jones would say, epistemic virtues. So different communities have different ideas of what understanding looks like, right? And in industry, often what understanding looks like is a good empirical result. So when you get machine translation that works, that's a good result. It doesn't necessarily mean that you understand it at all. So deep learning is a, is a triumph of that. We largely don't understand why any individual deep learning model works, let alone GPT or large language models now. We've just given up on interpretability. We have very little understanding of 
what matters in terms of the cocktail that creates deep learning or GPT-3, right? We try things out. Even the people who author these techniques are just like, I tried this thing out. It seemed to work. Then I published a paper and dropped out of school and created a billion dollar company. So it matters in terms of what people think the definition of mission accomplished is, right? Right now we're at a time where experiment is vastly outpacing interpretation or theory or statistics or any of that. Um, and abundant funding is flowing largely through industry rather than DOD and certainly not in academia. So that, that seesaw has gone back and forth depending on who was innovating and who was really pushing the envelope. So um, let's turn you to the public side. You have this, um, this sort of, you have this discussion in the book which talks about the state, the firm, and civil society, uh, which is nice to see civil society in this discussion. So often it's kind of, it's always like firms versus the government, or sometimes the market shows up, but civil society is always on the, on the ground. But maybe being a good Columbia undergraduate exposed to civil, you know, civil service or civil society, civil unrest uh, yeah. as well, it makes up part of that. So you make a comparison between Europe and the US which we know that Europe has been more proactive uh, and earlier in controlling some, particularly around privacy issues. Yeah. Whereas in the US, you know, we maybe gave things away. I'll, you know, I'll leave it up to you whether you want to do the Section 230 discussion or you want to talk a little bit about, you know, about just the way which is kind of, you know, is a freedom, a laissez-faire almost in the areas of having business own the data which they have, at least, they, and they're not liable for this, its use as well. So. Can you give us a little bit of a, a walkthrough on those issues? So we, we close the book. The last chapter of the book is intended to give hope. So to give the reader hope or to give the student hope in the case of the class. And it's also intended to zoom out. So there's, an, there's at this point in 2023, a pretty abundant literature in what I call dumpster fireology. Dumpster fireology is the enumeration of problems on the internet or problems in the information ecosystem. There's, there's plenty of books that just sort of say things are bad. Um, we wanted to give some sense for where there might be hope, and we wanted to zoom out. We didn't want to say, OK, well, hope is going to be Section 230, or hope is going to be Apple is going to shut down you know, privacy for Microsoft or, some, or Facebook or something like that. We wanted to zoom out and try to be um, analytic about the different contests. So rather than say it's all about government and how government is going to regulate corporates or how different corporates are going to fight with each other or how the people are going to rise up and enforce private ordering, we wanted to zoom out and look at the competitions among different powers. And we tried to divide powers into corporate power, state power, and what I would call people power, being a child of the 70s. I, th I think a legal scholar would call it private ordering. But um, Matt allowed me to call it people power in the book. So um, we, we tried to enumerate different contests that we saw as being most active right now, where we thought the resolution of those contests would have the most impact on our shared future. So state power is certainly drawn out. And that includes the role of the US federal government. That's sort of the thing. Most people, when they think about, well, things are bad, US federal government should fix it. And we try to zoom out and say, US federal government is only one of the sort of edges in the ways that power regulate each other. There's also uh, Europe, there's also states, there's also local, munici local municipalities. And there are all sorts of ways in which corporations regulate each other and can effectively deplatform each other. So the example of, of Apple um, taking away um, surveillance capitalism from Meta just in the, in the structure of Safari on the iPhone and how it can have a, a, a very large um, impact on the value of Meta by enacting a privacy change in the settings of cookies in Safari is an example of effectively one company deplatforming another. Now, why would it do that? Well, in, in part, this is staving off regulation. Part of it is drawing attention from the market, right? The individuals who might be choosing to, to use an iPhone rather than an Android device, for example. And then we talk a bit about uh, private ordering or the role of individuals. So individuals give these companies their money, give these companies their data, and individuals work at these companies and have impact on the product decisions made by these companies. So again, as an engineering educator, I know that I'm teaching engineers who will go on to be the data scientists working at Google, Meta, TikTok, 
who knows what else. Uh, and so we tried to enumerate the ways that individuals at these companies are having an impact on these companies. Some of it is internal by their individual day-to-day -day decisions, and some is uh, impacted f by more visible actions, which again, a legal scholar would call private ordering. That includes acting as a whistleblower, walkouts, leaks and plants to the press, and all of these things over the last five to six years have had a big impact in the, w in the way these companies present themselves as well as their product decisions. Just for, just for uh, clarification, the, the Section 230 is the section which was initially given, I think, to the smaller firms, you're right, that they would not be liable, the, their media companies not be liable for what they're, they're, they're publishing, I think, or something along those lines, maybe me. And then that was somehow passed on to these platform yeah. social media companies, which seems, which is where the, where the bizarreness begins to enter. Is that right? Yeah. So Section 230 is a good example of um, how United States law is full of these little dinosaurs, you know, things that were written in a completely different technological context and yet still control our present day via the way they are interpreted. Second Amendment is a good example, right? The meaning of a well-regulated militia in the, to the founders of the company is probably very different than uh, how, sec how Second Amendment is, reg is interpreted today. Section 230 actually dates to 1996, long before the existence of any information platform companies. Um, and it was a carve out within a larger law, Communications Decency Act of 1996, most of which was struck down as unconstitutional, but Section 230 um, remains, right? Section 230 meaning there was 229 sections before it. And it's just 26 words that says that information, I mean, they weren't called information platform companies in the day, but basically internet service providers, which were the companies that were providing you know, AOL or whatever company you were using to get online would not be held liable for content that was created by somebody and then AOL was the pipes that distributed that content, right? So those 26 words are sometimes called the 26 words that created the internet. In fact, there's a book called 26 words that created the internet and it has provided blanket protection to all of the information platform companies, Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook, everywhere in between, those companies have enjoyed protection from any liability or responsibility for the way they amplify, distribute, censor, because they do censor, content, thanks to those 26 words. So at the time we were putting our book, um, finalizing our book, you know, that was, it, it still remains contested and the Supreme Court occasionally picks up a case and tries to revisit what did we actually mean by these, or what did, what sh how should we interpret these 26 words? But there was a time, certainly in the waning days of the Trump administration, when Trump was openly tweet tweeting about Section 230 and how he was gonna force Section 230 to be reinterpreted in a way that was gonna force Facebook to promote content that was in his interests and to suppress content that was not in his interest. So that's an example of a contest, right? The contest around what even do we mean by these 26 words that was bringing together the electorate, elected officials, the leader of the entire free world, and private companies. So that's one of the examples of the contest that we try to, um, to flesh out in the book as an unresolved, contents, un unresolved contest. So I'm gonna end uh, with something very, very brief, and I'll turn it over to questions. Uh, I think I showed you, I was gonna ask you some short phrases to, uh, okay. and get your reactions on them. People may not know what the phrases mean, but I will ask you them. Um, so let me give you your favorite expression, uh, super intelligence. Fiction. Fiction, he says. So um, super intelligence is the thought that computers are smarter than us and they will take over basically our lives. Something like that, is that what the simple as that? Super intelligence is a phrase um, used by futurologists for the idea that computers will get smarter and the rate at which computers will get smarter and therefore their intelligence will exponentially increase and then at some point they will become smarter than us and that they will therefore take over control and we will be, I don't know, written off as a suboptimal species within whatever optimization algorithm the superintelligence is optimizing. The last, last one is existential risk. There are many existential risks. It's not clear that AI should be at the top of the list, right? The climate crisis, nuclear catastrophe, 
th there's several things that I think are real and present dangers in terms of the existence of the species, pandemics. I would not put um, AI at the top of the list of things that I would worry about in terms of existential crises. So now that Chris has given us comfort that there's so many other ways we can kill ourselves, uh, we, will, we will turn to uh, some, open, some open questions. I'm gonna try to run around on this. Uh, you're gonna have to help me pass the microphone around. Uh, okay, so let me just come to the back. I'll work from the back and I'll come, I'll come forward, okay? So, uh, and keep the questions a little short if you can so we can get, get many people in. Okay. This is my wife, hi, how are you? Hi, thank you for your talk. My name is Emily. I'm a PhD student in electrical engineering. Um, I have a question. So like, what do you think are potential consequences of the lack of explainability in these models, maybe in like medicine or other applications? Chris, oh, I'm right, Chris. <laughs> we were supposed to have two microphones today. I forgot why. Now I remember why, so. And maybe I'll take two questions next time. Okay. Um, Cynthia Rudin is a computer scientist, formerly at Sloan, now at Duke, and she has several papers about this, including a great paper called Stop Using Black Box Models for High Stakes Contexts. So you might enjoy her work, but in general, an uninterpretable model robs us of causal intuition and also uh, heightened awareness for edge cases. So you optimize a model based on an average behavior over some training, de training set. It's very difficult to know what will happen in some new situation in which the correlation among the covariates is different, which is a fancy way of saying what we mean by a causal model. If you were to go in and you were to change one variable, you don't really know what's gonna happen in the future. That problem is sometimes called correlation causation conflation. It's very old. There's a part of our book where we talk about a great example from the 19th century. The second is edge cases, which in the case of demography means underrepresented groups. So for any model where you don't have any intuition about the model at all, as a special case, you don't have an intuition for what are the groups for which the model is accurate and what are the groups for which the model is deeply inaccurate? And what are the biases that may be evidenced in the predictions of that model? So I think those are two of the general categories that are of concern. I think in particular, that's just like the academic case. The worst case is when you hook up an unpredictable black box algorithm to the internet, right? So James Mickens, who's a, a security researcher from Harvard, has a great talk about this, the use next talk from 2018, where he basically, he, he makes it in a much more hilarious way than I can, but he's basically like, we're taking this incredibly uninterpretable thing, black box machine learning algorithms, and then we hook it up to a hate-filled cesspool that is the open internet of people exchanging hate speech, and we have absolutely no idea how either one of those things interacts and we hook them up to each other and it's just a terrible idea. So you can enjoy his talk or you can enjoy Cynthia Rudin's papers. There's an academic context in which it's d disturbing and like for many reasons bad. And then in the healthcare case, as you mentioned, all sorts of reasons why it could be bad. So a, a good healthcare example, which you may know, is people doing um, radiology work where uh, radiologists presented many images to a machine learning algorithm and the machine learning algorithm was to make accurate predictions. And eventually what it was realized was that everyone who was, I think it was cancer positive, the radiologist had marked something in the upper right hand corner. And of course the machine learning algorithm was just like, you know, it had some ability to detect this marking in the upper right hand corner, like nothing of clinical significance whatsoever. That's something where you need interpretability in order to figure out how the algorithm is working. No clinical utility. But in addition, when these algorithms are hooked up to information platforms with society, which is itself changing its norms and behaviors and the way it interacts with things, um, it's, it, there's the potential to have a bad time. See, see some hands over, over here. I think you had your hand up, I'll go. 
so you touched on it a little bit, but I wanted to talk more about like the data sets that we're training a lot of these um, algorithms and AI systems on, like especially with the uh, um, epistemic issues of we don't really know how it's learning a lot of the black box models on top of, like you said, hooking it up to the internet, which can be a hateful cesspool at times, that if we want these like large language learning predictive models, are there alternative data sets to the internet to like, could we just like, how do we know that we're training them on accurate data? How can we put protections in place without risking having a bunch of suboptimal machines because we're only using like the finest data that only has 20 cases and then we can't actually create useful AIs? Uh, I'll take one more here. You have any story? So just pass this. Um, so we've been, this is a question of sort of a different flavor. Um, so you talked a little bit about the transition from like people trying to create these artificial intelligence algorithms using logic to one that's a little bit more data driven. And I think maybe this is mentioned in the book, but there is um, at least the impression that I get nowadays is that people sort of view data as like encapsulating truth in itself, that like something isn't necessarily true unless it's supported by the data. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on this. and how that may have come to be the case. Thanks. Great questions both. Um, to the first question, yes, it matters what you train on. And there was a good paper, and I'm, I'm forgetting the title of the paper, unfortunately. It's by Stefan Bubeck, who's at Microsoft Research. And it's called, Something is All You Need. I wish I could remember the first word. There's a famous paper called Attention is All You Need, which was the paper that introduced the transformer, which is the T of GPT. So Bubeck and co-workers co had this recent paper that was something else is all you need, but I'm forgetting what it was. Basically, what they showed is you can get performance that's just as good as GPT-4 with a much smaller model if you only train on encyclopedias and like legal texts and very carefully curated text rather than training it on like Reddit. So yes. If you train on, on a corpus of text that contains facts, and you're trying to get something that is factual, then choosing a good training set actually gives you an advantage. In this case, the advantage is expressed by having a much smaller model based on a much more high quality training set. Implicit in your question is, how do we keep, it, how do we keep these models from being trained on bagged data? That's sort of a statement about guardrails uh, for the designers. You know, you you choose you could choose carefully what data you're training on, which is not what's usually done. Usually, people train on the biggest data they can fit into their computer, which you know has you know eye popping, interesting results. But if you really want high quality results, you should train on high quality text. Um, to the second question about data and truth, that is a large point of the book: is how data is related to truthiness, and how data has long had this. Um, rhetorical valence. So we open up the book in part by talking about the word statistics and how when statistics enters the English language, it's about statecraft and how to, how to run a government, how to run a state. It has nothing to do with mathematics, let alone to do with data. And in the early 19th century, you get this fight between German statisticians about whether or not we should be allowed to look at tables of data and, and who are these ridiculous people who think that looking at tables where every row is a country and columns might be how many animals or the population has anything to do about understanding the, the state as opposed to people who understood the greatness of the leaders. It was, it was uh, dismissed as Gemeinstatistik or uh, the table makers. Vulgar statistics, it's sometimes translated, which is why there's a section in the book on vulgar statistics. So there's long been a fight as to whether or not data should even have a seat at the table when there's already a craft and people who understand that craft and are not interested in putting data to work to try to have a seat at the table and trying to understand that craft. Today, in many fields, it's the opposite, where to have numbers of something is to give extra, um, extra truthiness and, and somehow somebody who has data is presumed to be clear. One of the things we want to take apart in the book, and even in part one, is to make clear that there is always um, politics, even in the gathering of data alone. And by politics, I don't mean over relating to voting. I mean over related to power. So we lean heavily, for example, on Stephen Jay Gould's book, The Mismeasure of Man, where he spends a long time on Broca. So Broca is a 
scientist who we now know for Broca's, brain, Broca's area. It's a section of your brain which is impacted for language creation. Broca was interested in understanding brains because he was interested in craniometry and the claim that different races would have different intellectual abilities and they would be cleared by looking at the size of your brains, right? Broca was, as Stephen Jay Gould puts it, a very careful scientist and yet had extreme biases which shown itself in his analyses, including even choosing what data to include in his statistical analyses. Nothing to do with hyperparameters or deep neural networks or statistical analysis or p-values, just in what data he chose to include and what data he chose not to include. So one of the things we want to get at in the class and in the book is to encourage people to be aware of the innumerable subjective design choices inherent in any analysis of data, even to the point of choosing which data are to be gathered. So Gould has this excellent quote. He says, Broca is far enough away and we can look back his, his research and you know, cast aspersions on his biases. By what right, other than our own biases, do we think that we are free from that analysis and thinking that our, our truth is somehow uncoupled to society and class and everything else that shapes the lives and interests of scientists. So part of the reason that part one takes such a deep dive into understanding the construction of statistics alongside the construction of eugenics is not just to chastise you know, Sir Francis Galton because that's shooting fish in a barrel. It's to point out to people that even people who think of themselves as very progressive and governed by right thinking and truthiness are themselves functions of you know, their class and their context and to be critical, self-critical, and thinking about our, our perspective. That was a long answer except to say that that is one of the things that we want to tear apart in the book is the rhetorical valence of saying, because I have data, I have somehow access to more truth than others. So uh, like, I, this is why you don't want Reddit to be your only training, training data, is that, is that right? That's, that's my conclusion. So uh, let me just take a hand back here. I'm going to ask you to pass it back. Four rows. Thanks. Um, with everything going on in Hollywood right now, with the writers' strikes and now the actors' strikes, how has uh, the role of your team within the New York Times and in the industry perhaps changed? Or are you guys getting ready for a bigger battle in a couple of years? Or in terms of the use of LLMs to replace journalists? Hello, thank you so much for your talk, Professor. Um, I wanted to refer back to your discussion of like different actors of like a people power, like corporate power, state power, and specifically relating to the idea of like data generation and like ownership, because like as you said, these models are like so data hungry. So if you want to like leverage their power, like some kind of centralization of data would be like necessary for that. But I also like in the debate between kind of open source language models versus kind of companies saying, oh, like bad actors can do bad things, so we want to like keep it behind these gates. Like, what do you see as the like implications of different of those groups having access to data or like having control over data? And how do you see a way to like navigate or understand like data ownership through the framework of different actors and like the implications of where it being in different places? Thank you very much. Okay, so the first question is about large language models replacing journalists. Um, I, I don't have much to say publicly about where the New York Times stands <laughs> on large language models, other than to say that in my experience, people who work at the New York Times read the papers. So in general, people at the New York Times, I've found to be extremely well aware of GPT, large language models, generative AI. I can say, over the last decade of working with the New York Times, long, b before there was GPT, right, be before people were even using the phrase large language models, there was plenty of work on using algorithms to optimize news and optimize the delivery of news, including work to optimize you know, headlines or something. And by that, I don't mean at the New York Times, I mean at other publications. So I sometimes say that the New York Times has last mover advantage because you know, the New York Times has already seen what happens when a place like Gawker 
puts a big board in front of all the journalists, which they called the big board, which rewards journalists for getting the clickiest titles, right? And we know what happens. Gawker happens. So the New York Times, I think, has put its um, bet that there will remain a demand for journalism generated by humans and a subscription product in which people are paying for content that they trust. So I, I can't say much about LLMs in particular, but I think in general for computationally generated or computationally optimized uh, content, the New York Times has consistently viewed that as a differentiator in favor of the New York Times, because the New York Times is not doing that. Right? The New York Times instead has a ridiculously large newsroom compared to other publish publishers. Many, many journalists covering a variety of beats, reporting out a lot of stories, and a bunch of editors who are there because they're the best in the world at, at that job. So if anything, the moat between the New York Times and other content producers is the human beings. I think it's unlikely that the New York Times would want to report, re replace human beings with algorithms, LLM or otherwise. So again, I have nothing publicly to disclose about that, except I, I will tell you in my lived experience, people at the New York Times are not like unaware of algorithms and chat GPT and anything else. As far as the three-player game and the role of data, I will say that historically, like access to data has been um, valuable, and for um, you know, in many cases, for governments, that it's been true for centuries that the, uh, the possession of data about the working of that government has long been part of state secrets, and governments have not been particularly interested in sharing data about the working of that government. I, I say that because it's been true for centuries, and private companies also are not particularly interested in sharing. Um, the data about how that company generates its process. That said, for a really advanced technology company, those data are largely too big to transfer outside of that company and so specific to the instrumentation of that company that they're not so useful outside the context of that particular company. So access to data and more generally access to really good engineering and software products driven by data is definitely a differentiator. Common parlance right now is TikTok. So many people are talking about how TikTok has a great recommendation algorithms. That's a great example of a company that instrumented, worked real hard on a really sticky algorithm, created a digital product that made it easy for the user to provide signal to TikTok. Right? So that's a good example of a company where we look at that company and say, OK, well, investment in algorithm and data was itself the differentiator. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I have much more to add about the, the general value of it and, and the trend other than it's extremely valuable to have data. It's also extremely valuable to have a tech org where data are really powering the product, which is a, a lot of work besides just keeping the data. That's an important part. Um, I think I'll leave it at that then. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up at, at uh, this point. We're lucky to again to have the chance to have Chris Riggins here to talk about these uh, issues. Uh, and these are you know, great questions that we had. We could talk at length, obviously, about many of the issues which uh, uh, is in the, in the public debate uh, regarding uh, bias uh, and the difficulty of removing bias, uh, issues of, of, the, uh, of people feeling ripped off by their data, by their contributions uh, in these large uh, language models. Uh, big issue for journalists uh, as well, not only people who are in the Hollywood these, uh, these, uh, these days. Uh, you know, race is something which was, throughout the book, was interesting about you know, the, the issues on race was there from the, almost the very start of this, of this uh, discussion, as were uh, eugenics. So uh, there's always been this civil context of this, uh, around these issues of data and information. It's, that's, that's, no, uh, that's no surprise. Um, and that's why these meetings are actually are good to have these public discussions. So we become sensitive to them, we think about them, and uh, hopefully we create, uh, if not solutions, which would be wonderful, at least uh, awareness, which is a big part of the, uh, of the solutions uh, along, along the way. Um, Chris, thank you for that. And I also want to thank, once again, once again uh, this wonderful place, uh, dear mom, it's a beautiful location, and we get to, uh, we get to use it. Uh, thank you, Zach, thank you to your People who work here are always so friendly and uh, and great at what they do. Uh, it's just you know we're just lucky and fortunate that this is a new addition to the Columbia campus. Uh, so thank all of you again for coming. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.